Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Verily, all praise is due to Allah. We seek His help, we seek His aid, we seek His forgiveness. We seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our own souls. Whosoever Allah guides, there is no one to lead astray. Whosoever Allah leads astray, there is no one to guide upright. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship and truth except Allah alone. He has no partners and all dominions is his. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger and seal of all the prophets. O you who believe, fear Allah as he should be feared and do not die except as Muslimun. O mankind, fear your Lord who created you from a single soul. And from that soul he created his mate. And from them both he created countless generations of men and women. And fear Allah who, through whom you demand your mutual rights. And do not cut the womb that boils you. Surely Allah is ever and all watcher over you. O mankind, fear your Lord and always speak the truth. He will guide you to do good deeds and forgive you your bad deeds. And whoever obey Allah and his messenger has achieved a great amount of success. Verily the best speech is the book of Allah. The best guidance is that of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the worst of affairs is to introduce newly matters into this religion of ours. Every newly invented matter will go astray, and every going astray will lead into the hellfire. First of all, I would like to thank the brother for giving me this opportunity to be a reminder to myself first. As you know, I'm just a motivational speaker. I'm no sheikh. I'm no imam. I'm just here to remind the youth for some of the mistakes that I made in my past and some of the mistakes that we're still making today and hopefully we can take heed from it through the Quran and the Sunnah. The brother picked the topic, which path will we choose? And it was a part of my life that one day I had to make that decision, decision and I had to decide which path will I choose for my life. As the brother mentioned, I come from a background in the music industry. I was in a group called The Outlaws that was put together by a rap star by the name of Tupac Shakur. I appeared in over 40 million record sales worldwide. It was a particular time in my life that everything that you can imagine that you might think that we might think is successful as far in this dunya, I was able to achieve it. It was a particular time in my life that I had three brand new houses here in California. It was a time in my life that every time a brand new car would come out, I would be the first one in the car dealership making sure that I was the first one driving the streets of Los Angeles with that car. But one of the things that most of the people from the outside looking in wasn't able to recognize in me is that I didn't have any happiness. Even though I had houses, even though I had the cars, even though I had the money, I didn't have any happiness. It was a time of my life that every six months I was cashing checks for $150,000, $80,000, $200,000. I was a young kid, man, and I was living a life where I didn't have no guidance. And it was a time of my life that I thought happiness was going to come with the, how much money that I attain in this life. Like many of the youth, unfortunately, even amongst the Muslim youth, we living in a time when you see the Muslim youth seem like they're making a decision that the choice that they chose in their life is that they want to follow the path that many of us here in America is running away from. I want to start off with a hadith. Of course, I was saying in the English language, the Prophet Wasallam said to take benefit from five things before five things happen. He said, take benefit from your youth before your old age. Take benefit from your health before your sickness. From, take benefit in your wealth before your poverty, your free time before your preoccupation, in your life before your death. One of the things we kind of forget, especially when we're in our youth, we tend to believe that we got a whole life ahead of us. To the point that when you come speak to some of the Muslim youth and you say, look man, you shouldn't be doing that. The first thing they say, look man, I'm only having fun. When I get older, I can go to Hajj, I can make Umrah, and then I can become religious. One of the things we have to realize is that something is guaranteed for every single one of us in this room and it's called death. The scary part about it, we don't know when we're going to die. Allah says in the Quran in the English translation, He said every single soul shall taste death. That means every single one of us in this room we have to die. And we cannot wait till the angel of death come to us and snatch our soul up out of us for we can make that choice of what life we want to live. We cannot wait till the angel of death is in front of us and now we know that it's real what Allah says in the Quran. Now we know what the Prophet Sallallahu was, was telling us is real. We cannot tell the angel of death, wait a minute, let me turn off my gangster rap music and then you can take my soul. We cannot tell the angel of death, wait till I put my marijuana blunt out and then you can take my soul. Man, this is real life. We face something, man, that we only have today to get it right. 
Many of the youth, unfortunately, I'm not going to call you out. But when the brother was saying what path we going to choose, I seen some of the youth throwing up West Side here in the masjid right now. I'm not going to call you out. But if you think life is a game, if you think you want to follow the path of West Side, then either, either you don't understand your religion, either you t make a mockery of this religion of Islam, maybe you don't understand your religion, or maybe the shaitan fooled you to believe that you're going to live a long life. One of the things we have to realize, we're not, Jew, we not the Jews. We don't feel like we're the chosen people. Just because your name is Muhammad, or your name is Ahmed, or you born in Mecca, it doesn't matter. If you're not adhering to the Quran and the Sunnah, none of that stuff going to matter on Yom Kiyama. Your name is not going to matter, your lineage is not going to matter, whether you are Arab or not, it's not going to help you on a day. When Allah said this is a day that no, nothing going to benefit us, no wealth, no children, except for the good deeds. And we have to realize no matter how many good deeds we do in this life, we're not going to know if it's accepted until Yom Kiyama. Because Aisha, the wife of the Prophet wasallam, she said, in order for a deed to be accepted, it has to have two conditions. It has to have ikhlas sincerity, and it has to be according to the messenger of the sunnah of the Prophet So if we don't have sincerity in our good deeds, or if we do a good deed but it's not according to the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, it will be rejected. Like the brother mentioned, unfortunately we're living in a time when the Muslim youth are looking up for the, to the wrong role models. We're living in a time when you speak to the Muslim youth about, rap, about 50 cents, they would tell you what size drawers he wear, unfortunately. You ask them about Tupac, they would tell you what sneakers he wear. You ask them about the Prophet they would sell them or some of the Sahabas, unfortunately, we don't even know the Sahabas. The Sahaba, the people that Allah says in the Quran that Allah is pleased with them and they please with Allah. The Sahaba, the people when Allah says in the Quran in the English translation, He said, whoever opposed the messenger and follow a way other than the way of the believers, Allah said, we will leave them what they are upon, but at the end, we will land them in the hellfire where the evil destination. Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet wasallam, one of the Sahaba who was the most knowledge when it comes to the Quran, he said when Allah mentioned that believers in that verse, he was talking about us as Sahabas. Allah made it clear in that verse that whoever followed the way of life, this religion of Islam, other than the understanding of the Sahaba, Allah said we will let them believe they upon correct understanding, but at the end they will go to the hellfire. How many of us believe in the Quran in this room? That means we need to take this verse very serious. That if we're not upon the religion of Islam, if we're not upon the path of the Quran and the Sunnah with the understanding of the Sahabas, then we're upon the wrong path. Unfortunately, as simple as that. It's either right or wrong. It's either right or wrong. It's either something that's going to lead us to Jinnah, something that's going to lead us to Jinnah, or something that's going to lead us to the hellfire. There's no middle path. The way we live our life right now, we either live in a life that either we're struggling and we're striving to get to Jinnah, or we live in a life that we're doing the deeds that's going to end us in the hellfire. And unfortunately, man, I'm speaking to myself first. We have to understand, man, that tomorrow is not promised to us. Tomorrow is not promised to us. I remember back in the day before I accepted the religion of Islam, I used to basically live a life, like I mentioned, where I used to have everything in my reach. Whatever I wanted to make me so-called happy, I was able to do it because I had the money. But I remember I used to make excuses. I used to make excuses because I didn't have the religion of Islam. I didn't have no deen, I was a kafir. I used to make excuses, I used to say, man, I can live life whatever I want, because when I drop dead, Allah, whoever the creator of the heavens and the earth is, God, He's going to forgive me because I come from a background where I didn't have no parents in my life. I used to make excuses because when I was three years old, I witnessed my mother and father get murdered in front of me. I used to run with that excuse. I used to say, being that my mother and father got murdered in front of me, I can do whatever I want because on the day of judgment, God going to forgive me. Unfortunately, when I, I mean, fortunately, when I accepted the religion, religion of Islam and I started to read the Quran and I started to understand the Sunnah, my mind state started to change. I started to realize that every single thing that I do in this life, I will be held accountable for on Yom Kiyama, on the Day of Judgment. Allah said, even everything that we do, even if it's the size of an atom, Allah said that He will bring it forth on Yom Kiyama. We can fool each other all day. We can fool each other all day. But when it comes to Yom Kiyama, when we stand in front of our lives, no more fooling, no more fakeness, no more West Side. You ain't going to be throwing up the West Side on the Day of Judgment. This is real life. This is real life, man. It's very sad. Wallahi, bro, this hurt my feelings that I come to the masjid to remind myself and to remind the brothers, and I see a brother in the masjid throwing up West Side. This is very sad. This is sick that we come to this understanding that we in the masjid throwing up West Side. This is very sad. 
That we should be in the masjid trying to get closer to Allah. The masjid is a place for us to make our salat, for us to be trying to beg Allah to, be, to forgive us. Because every single one of us in this room, we all have sins on our back. Every single one of us in this room is a sinner. The Prophet ﷺ said every son of Adam is a sinner, but those who are best from amongst those that sin are those that do Tawbah. We should be rushing, we should be in the masjid saying, Alhamdulillah man, it's another chance that when I make Salat, I can ask Salat to forgive me for some of the sins I just committed earlier this morning. Or some of the sins I just committed five minutes ago. Because every single one of us in this room, we know we sinners. Don't sit here and make it seem like we just, because your name Muhammad or your name Ahmed or you born by, from the Quraysh or you, even if you born with your head, the pillow is the black stone, it doesn't matter on your we have to stick to the Quran and the Sunnah. We have one chance to get it right, and that's the Quran and the Sunnah. This is the understanding. Many of us, when you go to some of the Muslims, you say, Look, brother, do not do that. That's not from the Sunnah. Unfortunately, you hear this today. You hear many of the youth saying, Look, man, my Imam said I can do this. You telling me don't do this, but it's a difference of opinion. You telling me I cannot be a rapper? How come I can't be a gangster rapper named Muhammad the Killer? How, can I, how come I can't be a gangster rapper? What path are we going to choose, man? Do we want to be Muslim? Because when we follow the religion of Islam, this is a complete way of life. The religion of Islam, when Allah legislated the religion of Islam, when He said in the Quran that today I, I favored you by choosing the religion of Islam, this is our way of life, that means we have a way of life that we live. That means we dress a certain way. That means we behave a certain way. That means we have a certain adab, a certain clock that we carry ourselves by. We cannot be saying, man, oh, how you gonna judge me? Allah knows what's in my heart. My name is Muhammad the Killer. I'm using rap music to bring people closer to Allah. What type of deen, will you, what legislation we get that from? So when we say what path we're going to choose, every single one of us should leave the magic today and say, either I want to be upon the Quran or the Sunnah, or do I want to be like 50 cents? This is very important. This is a simple question. Do you want to be upon the Quran and the Sunnah? Do you want to be raised on Yomu Kiyama a chance to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Do we want to be with the Sahabas on Yomu Kiyama? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told his companion that you would be raised with those, who, those you love. Who do we truly love? Do we love the Messenger and the Sahabas? Or do you love the gangster rappers? Because if, if we're going to be raised with the people we love, do you want to be raised with Tupac? Do you want to be raised with 50 cents or do you want to be raised with the Sahaba and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? This is a decision that we have to make every single one of us in this room. This is very important brothers and sisters. We have one chance to get it right. That lifestyle that many of the Muslim youth are running to, Wallahi, common sense, how come many of us in America, right in front of our eyes, is running away from that life? If that lifestyle was so good, how come many of the people running away from that life and accepting the religion of Islam? And how come we have many of the Muslim youth running away from that life? And they running away from the religion of Islam, I mean, and they running towards a life that if you live in that life, man, it will end up going to the hellfire. This is a blessing, a nitmah to be a Muslim. This is a big blessing from Allah that He guided us to the religion of Islam. But we shouldn't end up there. We shouldn't say we're Muslim. We don't have to put in no work. Alhamdulillah said the shahada, Allah is the most merciful. The Prophet wasallam said if you say the shahada, Allah is the most merciful, man we're supposed to be striving for Allah's mercy. Alhamdulillah, Allah is, uh, Allah is the most merciful. But Allah also said that His punishment is shadeed. Every single one of us should be afraid of Allah's punishment. Every single one of us know we, what we do. Every single one of us in this room know what we do and what we don't supposed to be doing. If that's the case, we should be striving even harder so that we can get Allah's mercy. One of the things I wanted to remind the brothers, because the path that I want to talk about, what we should choose, is simple. The religion of Islam or path of Jahiliyyah. What else can we choose? There's no middle course. Either we're going to follow the religion of Islam, or we're going to follow the path of Jahiliyyah. A lot of the Muslim youth, I notice that they take role models from these rappers. I notice a lot of the Muslim youth, they walk around, they start imitating these rappers. They start behaving like these rappers. Some of them say, man, this is my culture. I was raised and I was born in America. This is my culture. We have to understand our culture is the religion of Islam. Some of the Muslim youth, they running around, they saying lyrics out of their mouth. You saying lyrics out of your mouth that you might not know. That you might, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said a person can say something out of their mouth that can land them in the hellfire. We can say something out of our mouth that can land us in the hellfire. How many of the Muslim youth you see running around saying the lyrics of Nas, the lyrics of Biggie, and, I, and the lyrics of Jay-Z? But I just want to show y'all some of the lyrics. I want to repeat some of the lyrics that some of the Muslim youth unfortunately are saying. Because when you go some of the Muslim youth and you say, hey, who's your hero? 
Unfortunately, man, this is very sad and it's not just the Muslim youth problem, this is every single one of us problem. Because the Prophet wasallam said the Ummah is one body. So one part of the body is aching, the whole part of the body is going to be feeling the fever. So when you see the Muslim youth saying that his role model was Nas or Jay-Z, this is very sad for every single one of us. But I just want to share with some of the words that our Muslim youth are running around saying. Another thing, everything that comes out of our mouth, the Prophet wasallam let us know that the angels are recording it. So while we driving in our cars and you bumping your gang some music and you might not be paying attention, but on Yomu Kiyama it's going to get played back. We will be ashamed to be raised up in front of Allah and all of a sudden our words and our deeds is played back in front of us and it's nothing but cuss words and it's nothing but horrible actions. We should have some type of shame that we'll be raised in front of Allah like this. I just want to say some of the lyrics for example, let's compare some of these rappers to the Sahabas. Let's compare who we should be following, what choice we should, we should make, what path should we be following. For example, Nas, that many of the Muslims, they believe that Nas is a Muslim, and even if he was a Muslim, doesn't mean that we should follow him. Because just because a person is a Muslim, our role models once again is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba. Nas said in one of his lyrics, he said, I am God's son, and y'all are my little children. And how many of the Muslims, they run around, they love Nas? This is their homeboy. This is their idol. Another thing that Nas says, to get away and escape the craziest, and I bet that there is a heaven for an atheist. He said that there is a heaven for an atheist. Therefore, all it takes is a Muslim with low iman to start believing in Nas. They might say, wait a minute, Nas said that I can be an atheist and go to heaven. Unfortunately, we got that. You got some people, man, I, I seen the other day, a, a Muslim brother was on the internet, he said every time something go bad for him, wallahi, he said every time something, every time something go bad for me, matter of fact, it might be on this event page of today. <laughs> I was reading the event page of today on Facebook, the event page that, to invite the brothers to this event, and I read one of the brothers said, every time something don't go right my way, I just holler thug life. What you hollering thug life is going to do for us? Allah says if something go bad, we say from Allah we belong to Allah, we return. We have, we have avenues in the Quran and the Sunnah that teach us. Why are you going to yell thug life? Biggie Smalls, for example, he said, when I die, I want to go to hell. You got to understand, man, we got our youth rapping these lyrics. Every single day, our youth is saying these lyrics. And we know this. These are the lyrics that's coming out of the Muslim youth mouth. These are the lyrics that the angels are recording. The Prophet Sallallahu told us if we could say one thing that could lead us into hellfire, we should be aware of what we're listening to. First of all, we shouldn't even be listening to music. First of all, we shouldn't be listening to this stuff. But I just want to remind y'all because maybe some of y'all just got off the boat, no disrespect, and y'all might not know the lyrics what y'all saying. No disrespect, y'all my brothers. Y'all might not be knowing what's coming out y'all mouth, so I just want to let y'all know. For example, Biggie also said, it don't make sense going to heaven with all the goody goodies. He said it doesn't make sense going to heaven. He want to go to the hellfire because he said this is where the party going to be. This is what he believed. Jay-Z said, I am God. His lyrics said, I am God with the flow. How many of our Muslim youth love Jay-Z? The reason why I'm bringing this up because I want to bring to your attention the stuff that these rappers are calling to. These individuals they're not going to come to the Muslim youth and say, look at man, I don't want you to be a Muslim no more. They're not going to come to us in that matter. They're going to come to us with an ideological attack. They're going to come from us on the side door. They're going to say, look man, you're an American Muslim. You, you being too extreme if you go your beard and make your salat. It's okay to do that, but you have to listen to Jay-Z. You have to listen to Jay-Z. Where's the American spirit? It's no problem being a Muslim and loving America. We're American. If you're American Muslim, alhamdulillah, is no problem. But that doesn't mean we have to take the filth that's going to come with being in America. That doesn't mean we're supposed to be, Allah says in the Quran, that we are the best people raised up for mankind. We're supposed to be the examples. When the people look at us as Muslims, they're supposed to want to be like us. We should not be want to be like these people. Another lyric that Jay-Z said, is the, he said, it's the return of God. Astaghfirullah, this is what these people are teaching our Muslim youth. Therefore, when you come to some of the Muslim youth, and we're surprised when we hear some of the Muslim youth saying, man, Allah doesn't love me, or I don't believe that there's a lot. Unfortunately, we're seeing a trend. You're seeing a trend of the Muslims returning their back from the religion, because unfortunately, they're looking up to the wrong people. I just want to say what Allah says in the Quran about the Sahaba, so that we, can take, we should know after this, inshallah, what path, we, who should we want to follow? Who should we take as our role models? Allah says in the Quran in the English translation, He said, 
about the Sahaba, he said, Allah said he is pleased with them and they are pleased with him. Allah says in the Quran, also like I mentioned, you are the best people ever raised up for mankind. This verse was sent down while the Prophet was amongst the Sahabas. Allah says in the English translation, he said, and the first to embrace Islam of the Muhajirun and the Ansar, and those who followed them exactly in faith. Allah says, man, those who follow the Sahaba with the same understanding. Allah said, Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah. The Prophet said, do not abuse my companions. For if any of you were to spend a gold equal to the amount on the Uhud and charity, it would not be equal of a handful to a handful of dust, to of a handful of one of them, or even a handful of equal to that. And that's my bad English translation. <laughs> so my point is, brothers and sisters, when we come to what path we want to choose, as a Muslim, we should not be confused. As a Muslim, we should not sit back and say, I wonder what path I should choose. Alhamdulillah, we have the Quran and the Sunnah. We have something that Allah sent down over 1400 years ago that never been changed. We have something, for example, we cannot sit back and say, man, we only have the Quran, we have the Sunnah. Because the Prophet wasallam said that it would come a time when an individual will be sitting on a sofa. And he said somebody will bring him a hadith of mine. And wallahi, we see this happening today. The Prophet wasallam said somebody will bring this individual a narration of mine. And that person would say, I do not want to hear the narration. I'm only following the Quran. I don't want to hear the narration. We hear this many times a day. Wallahi, when you bring certain stuff, to, a hadith to many of the Muslims, they say, well, we don't know that hadith da'if, or we don't know if it's sahih. I'm only sticking to the Quran. The Prophet said, Wallahi, three times. He said, woe to that man, three times. And then the Prophet said, they eat the flesh of a donkey, is haram. But do you see that in the Quran? No Muslim will eat the flesh of a donkey. But is it in the Quran that donkey means is haram? This is to let us know, man, that we have two revelations, the Quran and the Sunnah. When the Imam was reciting the Quran today, if I'm not mistaken, he said something. He said that Allah said something, if I'm not mistaken, because I don't know, the Quran, I don't know Arabic, but I guess it sounds like you said that Allah revealed the Quran in the Hikmah. Is that, did you recite that? No? You said Quran and Hikmah, I might be wrong, maybe because I don't know what I understand in another Arabic language, unfortunately. But when I heard that, when the, the Imam was reciting that, it's verses in the Quran when Allah did mention, I revealed the Quran to you and the Hikmah and the wisdom. The scholars in the Sahaba, they say the Hikmah is the, is the Sunnah. It's, verses, it's many verses in the Quran when Allah said, I revealed the Quran and its likes. And the like of the Quran is the Sunnah. So brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to tell you is that we have two revelations that we follow. We cannot be amongst the people that say I'm only going to follow the Quran because I don't know if this hadith is sahih or not. Man, Allah, He said that He, re he protected this religion. Allah protected this religion. We had people, man, our ancestors, they used to walk from Mecca to Iraq on a horseback or camelback just to get one hadith. They preserved the religion of Islam for us. So we have no excuse following the Quran and the Sunnah. We should not be confused. The Prophet wasallam said, I'm leaving you on a straight path. Its day is like its night. It is clear for the Muslims. If we want to follow this religion correctly, we have the way to follow this religion correctly. There is no excuse for us. We have the Quran and the Sunnah. We have it to this day. So it's very important, brothers and sisters, that we follow the path of the Sahaba. We don't follow the path of LeBron James. We don't follow the path of these people, man. We follow the path of the Sahaba because these are not my words. These are the words that the Prophet ﷺ, and these are the words that Allah told us. Many of us don't understand who the Sahaba is. I just want to show some importance of the greatness of the companions of Allah's Messenger. Ibn Masood anhu, he said, Indeed, Allah looked into the hearts of the servants and found that the heart of Muhammad ﷺ to be the best heart of mankind. And then he said, so Allah chose him to himself and made him a messenger. He said, then Allah looked into the hearts of his servants after the Prophet ﷺ and found that the best hearts of, of the servants is the companions to be the best hearts, the Sahaba to be the best heart after the mankind, after the Prophet ﷺ. So he made them ministers of his messenger. He said, so made them ministers of the messenger and fighting for this deen. He said, so whatever the companions hold to be good, then it is good with Allah. And whatever they hold to be evil, then it is evil with Allah. 
This is the Sahabas. Look at the status that the Sahabas have. That when Allah created the whole of mankind, He chose the Sahabas to be the best mankind after the, after the Prophets. Can you imagine the status of the people, of these people? That the best of mankind after the prophets are the Sahaba, the people from Arabia, from Africa, from Persia, from Roman. These are the Sahabas, these are the best of mankind. These are the people we should be looking up to. This is very simple. Very simple. We should be looking up to the Sahaba. Because the path, the other path is Jahaliyyah. There's only two paths, right or wrong. It's Islam or it's Kufr. There is no middle way. There is no middle way for us to follow. We have to follow the path of the Sahabas. We have to follow the religion of Islam. Myself and when I was in the music industry and I got to the particular point in my life I used to run all around the face of the earth to find happiness I used to look around everywhere for tranquility I used to look for happiness through my money I used to sit back and I used to say how come I have a brand new house but I don't have no Sakina And I used to say matter of fact I need to go buy another house And a matter of fact I'll go buy another house I used to sit back and I used to tell myself, Wallahi, this is what used to go through my mind. I used to sit back and I used to say, man, how come I'm still depressed? And I remember one time I said, maybe because I don't know my Puerto Rican roots. Wallahi, this is what I was looking for. Because my mother's Puerto Rican and Cuban, I was raised on my African American side, so I said, you know what? Wallahi, I'm getting on a plane, I'm going to Puerto Rico. If you don't believe me, my little brother's in the corner, I bought an airline ticket for my little brother, I bought an airline ticket for my cousin, I bought an airline ticket even for a translator. Because I thought happiness was in Puerto Rico. I got to Puerto Rico, three days later I was back to depression. I used to go back to sleep and I used to say, man, how come I cannot find happiness? And then it got to a point in my life that I said, matter of fact, it's no need for me to live anymore. Because I got the money, I have the jewelry, I have the fame. And if this is all life has to offer me, there's no need for me to live. It wasn't until that brother gave me the English translation of the Quran. And when I started to read the English translation of the Qur'an, the first time that I read the English translation of the Qur'an, I said, Wallahi, this cannot be the words of a man. This cannot be the words of the man. This has to be the words of the Creator of the heavens and the earth. And that's when I noticed that everything that I was, every avenue that I was searching for happiness, I was looking for in the wrong way. Because the Creator of the heavens and the earth created us. He knows what's best for us. And this is why he revealed the religion of Islam and he's sitting down the Quran and the Sunnah for us. And it's sad that when I come to the religion of Islam and I see our same Muslim youth saying that they're not happy, that they're not depressed, and they look for every avenue for happiness rather than turning back to the Quran and the Sunnah. It's sad that when I speak to some of the Muslim youth and they say, man, I'm not happy. I'm not happy at my house. Man, we have the cure. The Quran is the cure. Allah said that this book is a healing for the hearts. We have our happiness, man. We don't need a million dollars to be happy. Man. We don't need a million dollars to be happy. We don't need a big house to be happy. We don't need to have a chain around our neck and to pretend we Jay-Z when we're in the middle of the bathroom when none of our relatives are looking. We don't need none of that to be happy. Happiness comes from following the Quran and the Sunnah. Allah says in the Quran in the English translation, He said, truly the hearts find tranquility in the remembrance of Allah. Allah said that He show us signs within ourselves. When we start committing sins and we start being disobedient to Allah, then all of a sudden we end up not happy and depressed because this is what sins do to us. So as a Muslim, when we're not happy, when we're feeling depressed, we should tell ourselves, myself personally, this is what I tell myself first, when things don't go right for me, I start feeling a little something in my heart, I say maybe I'm doing too many sins. Maybe it's time for me to return back to my Lord, do Toba, and stay away from sins. And wallahi, every time I do that, all of a sudden I start feeling the same sakina again. Man, the religion of Islam is the haq. The happiness is going to come from this religion. No need to look nowhere else. Wallahi, brothers and sisters, I've been there and I've done that. No need to, you think Beyonce is happy, you think Jay-Z is happy, man, if you spend one hour around these people, you will see that they dope and so, they using so many drugs to escape the reality. They have to get high to escape the reality. We as a Muslim, we have the religion of Islam. Follow the religion of Islam. We have the right choice that we should make, let's make that choice today. Let's return back to the religion of Islam. Tomorrow is not promised to us, but today, we have today, the rest of the day, inshallah. Whatever we did yesterday, is no, no, is no way that we can change that. We should just return back to the religion of Islam. We should ask Allah to forgive us, and we should start today. Many of the Muslim youth, I noticed that some of us don't even make our salat five times a day. Man, today is the chance that we should start praying our salat. Today is a chance that it's never too late. Allah is the most merciful. It's never too late for us to return back to our religion. 
It's never too late to say, man, no matter what sins we did this morning, no matter what sins we committed last night or yesterday, man, Allah is the most merciful. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ told us in the narration, he said that when the servant returned back and asked Allah to forgive us, forgive him, he said Allah is so happy with that servant and the Prophet ﷺ, he striked the similar to him. He said Allah is happy when we do toba similar to when a man is in the desert. And this man is traveling in the desert and he had all his belongings such as his risk, his provision, his water, his food and his money was on the, on, on the back of his riding beast. And when he lay down to take rest, his riding beast take off with all his provision. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine being in the desert and your riding beast take off with all your money? No ATM card going to work in the desert. All your money, your drink, your food, everything is gone. Then the Prophet said, so this individual, he take rest. Waiting for death to come. There's nothing he can do. He lay down, he take rest against the tree or whatever, or whatever, and he say, man, there's nothing from going to happen to me but death. And when he opened his eyes, he see that his riding beast is right there. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, out of happiness, this individual, he grabbed his animal and he said, Oh Allah, I am your Lord and you my slave. Out of happiness, the Prophet Sallallahu said, when we ask Allah to forgive us, when we make tawbah, he said, Allah is more happy with us than that person is right there. Another Sahaba said, I forget the name, he said a person who commits a sin and do toba is like a person who never committed sin at all. Man, we have a merciful Lord, but of course it's shadeed, it's punishment, it's shadeed. Many of us don't even take advantage of the mercy of our Lord. So let's guarantee us, I mean, let's tell ourselves, make a promise to ourselves that we're going to at least try to return back to the Quran and the Sunnah. So Jazakallah khair for your time. Maybe we go into some questions and answers, right? Wassalam. It was a, a point in my life, like I mentioned earlier, I just gave up deep down in my heart. I was just through with life. Even though people around me, they didn't really know what I was going through, but it was a, tur a turmoil. Every single night I was going through something that I was fighting with inside of me that I was basically giving up on life. And I just had a mentality that I wanted to stay numb. And staying numb in the streets, of course, is like abusing intoxicants and things like that to try to forget the life that I was living. And I happened to be in a recording studio with my little brother, alhamdulillah, he came today. Mashallah, and we got into a fight. And we got into a fight, and it happened to be a Muslim brother who was in the parking lot who calmed the things down, and he invited me to the masjid. This Muslim brother invited me to the mosque. And when I went to the mosque, he eventually gave me English translation of the Quran and literature of the religion of Islam. And when I took it home, man, it was just like a, 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 a fresh of breath air, man, that I didn't, I was surprised, shocked that I was living my life without this and my life for this long. I was chasing, like I mentioned earlier, the happiness in all our own avenues. When I first read the Quran, I knew that this was from the creator of the heavens and the earth. It was very clear to me that this made sense. Also prior to that, after the death of Tupac, after the death of Qaddafi, who was a childhood friend of mine, a member of the Outlaws, I started to lose people that was close to me, and I started to start thinking about life and death, what's going to happen to me in the next life, you know? Uh, when you converted into Islam, do you look back at your music with regret or as a lesson? Um, when I accepted the religion of Islam, and the more that I started to learn about the religion of Islam, I look back at my music in the form of, um, I, didn't, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with what I said in my music. I don't agree with the past. Um, you know, I looked at it, it was cut of a lot, so I can't really be in regret of the past because it happened, but I definitely don't agree with it, you know? Well, first of all, alhamdulillah, we know from right from wrong from the religion of Islam, we have the Quran and the Sunnah, but everybody make mistakes, you know what I mean? None of us is perfect. So when I make the wrong mistake, man, I try my best to fix it by asking Allah to forgive me. And I try my best and struggle to never make that mistake again, you know. We all going to fall into right. We all going to make our wrong. You know, that's part of life and that's part of being a human being. But at the same time, we should ask Allah to forgive us and we should struggle to try to never make that mistake again. Is it true if you're moving to Saudi Arabia? That's alhamdulillah. I am moving to Saudi Arabia, alhamdulillah. That's true. Inshallah in a few weeks, inshallah. It's my intention, inshallah, to get there so that I can study the Arabic language. I've been Muslim for eight years. I kind of feel guilty that I don't know the Arabic language. I kind of feel like a loser a little bit, you know what I mean? So, inshallah, I want to be able to learn the language of the Quran, inshallah. I think the first step of a person from looking to the religion of Islam, one, don't judge the religion of Islam by us, the Muslims, because guarantee you, we're going to chase you away. But I think... Um, 
She should read, he and she should read about the, read the Quran in English translation, read about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu because the Prophet Sallallahu like his wife Aisha said, that he was the walking Quran. So if you want to know about the religion of Islam, go with the base, the Prophet Sallallahu his life, read the English translation of the Quran, inshallah. And of course, if you're around Muslims, you can ask them, you know, basic questions about the religion of Islam. And a lot of us, we're in the path that we're in, and we want to make Tawbah, but we don't, know, we don't know how to. Exactly, like, like um, I can speak from experience, you know what I mean? Like I mentioned earlier, the Prophet Wasallam said, Every son of Adam is a sinner, but those who are best from among those that sin are those that do Tawbah. So no doubt about it, there's no perfect Muslim on the face of the earth. You know what I mean? We all have our shortcomings, but at the end of the day, we should always be fighting to fix and better ourselves. You know what I mean? One of the things you mentioned is the people we hang around, companionship is very important. If you're around people that's calling you to commit evil and do this, it's going to be very easy for you to fall into evil. But if you want good, we should try to surround ourselves with people that fail lot. And every time we make a mistake, we should at least do Toba. You know what I mean? Alhamdulillah, man, Allah is the most merciful. We should continue to make Toba. We shouldn't get to the point that we commit sins and we don't even ask Allah to forgive us. Because like one of the Sahaba said, I forget his name, like I mentioned earlier. He said, a person who commits a sin and do Toba is like a person who never sinned at all. So every time we commit a sin, we should do Tawbah. Even if we do it again, we should continue to do Tawbah. Because Hassan al-Basri, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, he said that the shaitan wished that he could come between us and our Lord by, every, by us committing the same sin. And eventually the shaitan would say, man, you just committed that sin. Why are you going to ask Allah to forgive you again? To the point that we give up on asking Allah to forgive us. So we should continue to make Tawbah because every single one of us, we are in need of Allah's forgiveness. You know what I mean? And companionship is very important. Definitely. How old were you when you converted to Islam? When I converted to Islam, I was 22 years old, alhamdulillah. And did you have to change with your ways before and how you were living? I want to know if it was, was a smooth transition. Man, I'm, the transition still hard for me, man. I'm still trying to get it together. But um, of course it wasn't, you know what I mean, it wasn't easy because all my life, I was believed that the way I was living my life was correct. So for you to live a certain life and believe that you are correct and then all of a sudden you find out that you was wrong, it's going to be hard. You know what I mean? The first 10, 10 13 years, the Quran was real. It was only about Tawheed when it was revealed. Even Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Wasallam, she said at the beginning when Islam was revealed, the verses of the Quran was revealed saying that this is haram and this is haram. Nobody would accept the religion of Islam. So for me, alhamdulillah, I can't front, man. I'm still trying to get rid of stuff I have in me from Jahiliyyah. I'm still struggling with that, you know what I mean? But one of the things that I can say really helped me a little bit, mashallah, by the mercy of Allah, is dua, begging Allah, you know, keep making dua to Allah to guide us to the correct path. We always make that dua. And also companionship. Alhamdulillah, when I was able to get with the brothers at the Majid Movement in, 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 in Los Angeles, we have an a, a imam there that studied overseas, Farid Abdullah. We had some brothers there that studied. Mashallah, these brothers was hitting me with Quran and Sunnah that was basically bringing me Dalil. They put me in a position that said, okay, because many of us, we say we love our religion of Islam. But mo many of the time, when something comes to us from the religion of Islam, we make excuses. So we should ask ourselves, how much do we love this religion? And if this is what the religion tells us to do, we should struggle our utmost to try to do it, inshallah. When we fall down, we ask Allah to forgive us. Because we always going to make mistakes, you know what I mean? When I converted to Islam, what did I do with everything I had before? <laughs> well, many of the things that I had before, um, was haram ways and it's a saying that things that's haram don't last you know what I mean so a lot of the stuff alhamdulillah I had to walk away from for example my connection to the music industry I got a fatwa from one of the scholars of Medina and I found out that it was haram for me to keep collecting that money because of the point that that money was coming from new music sales and things like that so I was able to alhamdulillah walk away from that and just start a new life alhamdulillah you know what I mean? I might have lost certain stuff as materialistic things, but I gained the religion of Islam, alhamdulillah. That money can't buy, you know? Now the first question, um, no doubt, Pop, it was a time of his life he was definitely suicidal. And um, I remember many a times we'd be sitting in the living room with Pop and he used to say, for example, he want to go into the garage, turn the car on, and, and, and kill himself or he feel like murdering himself. Many of the times he used to say this. And I remember when he went to Death Row Records, he started to make a lot of money. He just bought him a house in Malibu, literally his backyard, our backyard literally was the ocean. I don't know what ocean it was, but it was the ocean. You know what I mean? 
and he was, we, used to, we were sitting in the living room one day, we used to sit in the living room kicking it, and I remember he said something that it actually was the first, the first thing after his death that I remembered that he ever said, said to me before, because it made me start to realize that we're not in control of, of when we're going to die. And he looked at me and the rest of the outlaws and he said, remember how I used to always speak about how I don't want to live anymore. He said, but for some reason now that I just bought my Rolls Royce, he had a nice Rolls Royce. He said, I just bought this house, I'm on Malibu, look at my backyard, it's the beach. He said, for some reason I want to live. He said, I want to live so that I can enjoy this. A couple months later, that's when he died in Las Vegas. And from that day, when he passed away, the first, one of the first thoughts that I started to think about is that conversation that I had. And I started to realize that we're not in control of our death. Because growing up all my life, I used to believe that I know when I'm, you know, some of the Kufar, they still believe when you tell them, man, you don't know when you're going to die. They say, I know when I'm going to die. You know what I mean? We have this understanding. So when you see someone that's very close to you, you know, searching for death or chasing after death, I seen when he was suicidal. And then you see a point of his life where he want to live, and then all of a sudden he died, it made me start to realize that we, we don't know when we're going to die. Um, alhamdulillah, um, Allah is the most merciful. He's our razak he's the provider. After I left the music industry, I was able to invest in some businesses. Alhamdulillah, I have a clothing business. Like the brother mentioned, we have some t-shirts out in the lobby. I also have a production company where we're going to start producing Islamic DVDs. The first DVD is a documentary about my life. And um, different businesses. Alhamdulillah, Allah is the most, he's the provider. You know? So Allah has been providing for me, been opening up the doors for me. Alhamdulillah. How you know? was it? Like to, to read the Quran and understand the poetry, did it, did it change at all, did, like your understanding of poetry and the concept? After accepting the religion of Islam, the first time that I read the Quran, no doubt, I knew that this was from Allah, because I was used to, as a musician, you pay attention to other people's lyrics, especially rap artists. Uh, we used to buy other rap artists just to hear the lyrics. And then it comes to a point where Tupac, for example, he was a genius when it comes to writing. So when I read the Quran, I knew that a man can never ever come up with these words, even though it was an English translation. But one of the things I did after accepting the religion of Islam, man, I kind of fell back. And I, 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 right now, I'm not involved in the music industry no, at all. But I kind of fell back, even I stayed away from poetry. And to alhamdulillah, some brothers, mashallah, one of the brothers here, I'm going to call him out, Muhammad Salamat. You know, he's one of the brothers who's on the sunnah. He used to tell me and, and remind me that the poetry is a form, this is from the sunnah. You know, we had the Sahabas that do this, you had the Salaf that done this, they do poetry. So recently I did, you know, started writing poetry again. You know, I was a little rusty. My first poem sounded like Curtis Blow, old school, so, but alhamdulillah is getting a little better. It, huh? No, I don't remember, man. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't like to perform and I'd rather do it just to write it and things like that. But alhamdulillah now and I feel like I have something to talk about. Before, if you really think about it, I didn't really have too much substance, nothing really to talk about but draw by shootings. You know what I mean? But now alhamdulillah we have the religion of Islam, we have stuff that we can talk about that inshallah will be pleasing to Allah, you know? Unfortunately, when Pak died, he, um, he died as a non-Muslim. He didn't accept the religion of Islam. He knew about the religion of Islam to the point that he had a lot of relatives that was Muslim. He respected the religion of Islam, but he didn't accept the religion of Islam. Do you feel like uh, the Illuminati had a, a big effect on the people around you? And were you yourself approached by some of these people? To be honest, I'm gonna be honest, I don't really even know what the Illuminati is. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest, man. I really don't really hear too much about it, but from the Muslim youth. I don't really know what the Illuminati is. I never ran into an Illuminati man. I never ran into none of this stuff, you know what I mean? And I think one of the reasons why Pac actually did that song, Kaluminati, and he put a K in front of it because he said, kill, kill, kill that noise. Whatever it is, it's a bunch of hype that you also see it amongst the Muslims, unfortunately, man. And I, personally, I might think that this is some type of way to divert, divert the Muslims from remembering of Allah. Because everywhere I go, Allah, no matter what country I am, I always hear the Muslim youth speaking about Illuminati, you know what I mean? One of the things we have to realize, even if this secret society, whatever it is true, nothing can happen without the permission of Allah. Nothing can happen without His permission, you know what I mean? When I accepted the religion of Islam, I was going through some, like, some trials with people that was close to me. Um, the members of the outlaws, for example, it, it, to them from the outside looking in, it was strange. You know, one day I'm inviting them to come to the party in the club, then the next day I'm saying I, this is evil. So of course they did think I was a little weird at the beginning. Alhamdulillah, they all accepted Islam. Every member of the outlaws is a Muslim. 
They all became Muslim, alhamdulillah. When you know the religion of Islam is not a religion of opinions. And it doesn't really matter my opinion. We follow the Quran and the Sunnah where we have proof from the Quran and the Sunnah that music is haram. There is no difference of opinion. Nobody can come. Maybe they might kick, never bring me back in this masjid after this, but I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> but music, in the religion of Islam, musical instruments is haram. You have a verse in Surah Luqman, when, when um, Allah used the word Lalu Hadith, with Ibn Abbas and Tafsir Ibn Qadir, Ibn Abbas said the word Lalu Hadith means musical instruments. You have many hadith, sahih, authentic hadiths, where the Prophet wasallam said it would come a time where people would try to make halal a few things, and one of them things he used was musical instruments. You have many hadith and narrations from the Sahaba, from the Prophets, from the Prophet wasallam that we cannot use music, you know what I mean? Um, all four schools of thoughts, Maliki, Hanafi, Hanbali, Shafi, all four schools of thoughts say musical instruments is haram. And of course I'm not a scholar, I'm not a student of knowledge, I'm nothing, I'm not a person that could come and give a fatwa what's haram and halal. But alhamdulillah when I accepted the religion of Islam, I have to basically go investigate this because this is the way I was making my money. And the scholar said of course if you know something is wrong and your Muslim brother asks you, you should tell him the truth, no beating around it. If you go investigate from the Quran and the Sunnah, you will know that musical instruments is haram. You know, it's not permissible, bro. Except for the duff, which was preferred for the woman to play in front of other women for weddings and things like that. You know? Uh, on that, I just want to pose a question for you too. Just really think about is kind of how much uh, music is a part of our lives. And just really think about how many songs we might know compared to like how much we you know. Right? And how much it really enters into our heart. How many times you're in Salah and, you're, and it starts to play in your mind, right? Or it takes you away again from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so often it's like these words or this music has become more beloved to us nowadays, let's just be real, it has. No, no. It's become more beloved to us than the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, than the speech of Allah, right? The one who gave us life. Right? So uh, something just to think about. Uh, let's go back over to the Can speech. I say, can I add on one thing yes. real quick? Yeah. One thing, because MashaAllah, everything that Allah and His Messenger tell us to stay away from is only for us to benefit from it. It's not to make things hard for us. One of the things that I wanted to mention is that something happened recently with a, some doctors and some scientists. They started doing research on a lady who every time she listened to a certain instrument, every time she listened to a certain instrument, she fall out and catches a seizure. Now the doctors and scientists are saying that it's something in that song, it's an instrument in that song that is affecting her body physically. It's affecting her physically and mentally to the point that she will fall out. So when you hear the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling us to stay away from musical instruments, it's not so that the Muslim life can be boring and we cannot have fun. It's only for our benefit. It's only for our good. Even if we don't understand it, man, it's a religion that came as a mercy for us. So we have to understand that this is true, this is good for us. You know what I mean? What do we most towards Islam? What drew me most? Well, when I first started to... Um, Look into the religion of Islam, it was the brotherhood that I seen when his brother invited me to the mosque. But it was something just about the simple oneness of Allah, you know what I mean? I never read anything that basically put so much emphasis on why we should worship Allah alone, why we shouldn't set up any partners, and what's the benefit for us. And if we worship Allah alone, we're going to get Jinnah, inshallah. So that kind of, it kind of drew me, just the, the adab of the way the Muslims was behaving. Wallahi, when I went to the mosque and I was looking at the brothers from the outside looking in, just the way they was treating each other, it kind of drew me to want to know more about this religion. So, um, how did, like, when you accepted this time, how did your family react, your brother, and just your close, immediate family? Alhamdulillah, when I accepted the religion of Islam, one of the things about my family, they're very supportive. Um, majority of my family are Christian, but they seen that this was a way of life that was better in myself. Alhamdulillah, all my brothers accepted religion and Islam. My cousins who was very close to me, they all accepted, like close family cousins, they accepted religion and Islam too. So Alhamdulillah, you know. Alright, um, what message or advice would you give to your younger brother who is converts around the world? To fellow converts around the world? Um, the message I would give myself, you know what I mean? The religion of Islam, this is a religion that we gotta keep struggling and striving until we in our grave. It's a religion that we don't want to accept the religion of Islam and just fall back and don't feel like we have to do anything. Just let's continue to strive, get closer to Allah, continue to learn our religion until we're in our grave, inshallah. Every time we slip, we ask Allah to forgive us and we get back up, inshallah. What is the best way that you can encourage the youth to stop listening to music? What is the best way? I can speak from experience. 
when I first accepted religion and Islam, one of the hardest things for me was to walk away from the music industry. Not only that, for me to stop listening to music. Uh, Alhamdulillah, from the mercy of Allah, I didn't listen to music in five years. One of the things that I can say from my experience that helped was a lot of dua. A lot begging Allah. Once I knew when the brothers bring me the proof that this was wrong, every day I would ask Allah to basically put it in my heart that I hate the things that he hate and love the things that he love. And I used to beg Allah to guide me away from that. And also companionship, very important, bro. When you hanging around people and every time you get in their car, they listening to music, it's going to be hard. But if you're hanging around people that doesn't listen to music, it, it makes it easier for you. You know what I mean? It may Allah make, make it easy for all of us. Um, when I first started reading the Quran, as I remember, it was the, from the beginning, you know, al fatiha and even though, mashallah, al fatiha is a short surah of the Quran, but it was very strong for me. You know, it was very strong for me to read the words. The, the whole Quran that I was reading, mashallah, as a musician who write and pay attention to other words, the whole Quran that I read, mashallah, was a wake-up call for me. And the same with the hadith, mashallah, you know. How do you cope with your old, like, not doing what you used to do as a Muslim now? But like I mentioned early, man, wallahi, I'm still struggling trying to get this jahali up out of me. You know, I still got a long way. Um, alhamdulillah, companionship help. And um, wallahi, it's not easy when you was used to a certain lifestyle, then you accept the religion of Islam. It's not like I don't want people to look at me and think that I don't have no shortcomings or I don't fall into error. You know what I mean? Because I'm still struggling to get closer to my Lord. Like I mentioned earlier, though, as a Muslim, when we make mistakes, we should always do tawbah and ask Allah to forgive us. I wish that I could sit here and say, man, I don't do nothing for my past, man. I'm clean, but that's not true. So I'm still struggling to get closer to my Lord. You know what I mean? What do you think is like the most important part of Islam that we should like study and like learn about the most, like us as you? The most important thing of Islam that we should learn about, of course, the religion of Islam, the whole of the religion is good, alhamdulillah, but Tawheed is very important. Because even many Muslims, unfortunately, we don't even know Tawheed. Many Muslims, we don't even know the oneness of Allah. So I think it's very important that this is a subject that we should always be focused on and continue to try to study, inshallah. I also want to just mention real quick that I have some CDs out right on the desk of um, when I'm passing out my shirts. It's about a, one of the hadith of, of Mu'ad ibn Jabal. And it, it, it talks about Tawheed. When the Prophet told Mu'ad that, do you know Allah is right over you? And et cetera, et cetera. So the, the CDs are out there for free if anybody want to grab them, grab them, inshallah. On the table, we'll be selling the shirts, inshallah. Anybody that was going to buy the new Jay Z album, go buy my shirt instead, inshallah. Any other want to thank Brother Musa for coming out. Let's get a couple of take beers for him. Take beer. Allah, take beer. Allah, take beer. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to bless you in this work to accept your efforts. As you do, we're putting this together with these. Amen. Uh